pray thank you so much for that and we praise you for that. I pray all this in your name, amen. Amen. Clark, thank you. Thank you for letting the spirit lead you in song choice and the, the song right before this one, Christ, our hope in life and death. And then just one right now, our hope when he comes for us as we will be when he comes. I mean, what is that? That is this end time series that we have been right now. And it is about the hope of our future, the presence of the creator. And so last week uh, we were looking at that the church is the bride and Christ is the uh, bridegroom and that he is coming for us. And in the meantime, he told us he has gone to prepare a place for us that where he is there we may be also. And so we wait in that expectation in our life right now. And, and we call that moment when he comes for us, the rapture. But it is the rapture that begins where we're going to be looking today, the tribulation. Now, uh, real quick though, um, anybody here been to amusement park? Anyone? Yeah, okay, all right, good, good. Yes to Texas. So there's, there's a rhythm to a, a, an amusement park. You go and you stand in line, all right? And in fact, it, and there's a rhythm to that being in line, so much so that they can put signs up and says, you know, from this point, you're 43 minutes away. You know, there's this rhythm. And so you go through this rhythm. It sort of just goes da-dum, da-dum, da-dum. And you make your way to each post. And you finally make it up to the ride. And then there's still a rhythm to that. You know, you sit down, then you realize, oh, maybe I should hold my, my glasses in my hand. Or you've got that $30, you know, thing of Coke right there. And I better go put that to the side. Then you sit down and you buckle yourself in and, you know, pull that bar down. You go, oh Lord, please let this bar hold. And there's still this rhythm to it. And, you know, it's just da-da-da-da-da-da. And the people that work there, they come and they tug and they check and they make sure and they've gone all the way. You know, you can see them coming here. They come and keep coming, keep coming. And after they go through that, there's still this rhythm. Then they, you ever seen the person behind the, you know, the desk thing that has the, you know, the button right there and they do this to everybody and then they do this. And you see that there's this rhythm. And there's these couple of rides there at, at Fiesta Techs. Uh, Texas, you know, the boomerang and the poltergeist. And, you know, if you're older, you're used to, you know, roller coasters. Da, 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 da. But these rides, all right, there's this rhythm. You've been waiting in line. They've done their checks. You've done all these things and you sit there and all of a sudden what happens? Whoosh! And there you go, you know, zero to 60 and, and you know, two seconds type thing. And why do I tell you that? Because today I need you to hang on. We're about to go whoosh. Because we're going to be looking at the tribulation and the second coming today. As we've called it, it is trouble and triumph. Because tribulation means trouble and the second coming is ultimately triumph. So please make sure that you are buckled in. I'm probably going to talk too fast like I normally do. But we need to cover quite a bit. Now, let's talk about the, the, the tribulation after the rapture of the bride. Now, real quick, there is... Um, there can be, not necessarily y'all, there can be this idea as you look into the tribulation, like, wow, God, God, he's, he's sort of mean. And I need you to know this, all right? You know, multiple places in scripture, but in Numbers, he tells us that God is long suffering, that he has great mercy. He is forgiving iniquity and transgression. But notice that long suffering, it's that idea of patience turned up a few degrees. All right, second Peter tells us the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, but he is what he is long suffering to us. You see, in the midst of creation from the beginning with Adam and Eve till now, God wants relationship with us. And he has sent the prophets. He has sent scripture. He has sent his son, Jesus. From there, we have the apostles. We have all of these evidences throughout time of God's long suffering, wanting relationship to us. But God is a holy God, all right? He is just, he is righteous. We have sinned. There are consequences. God is long suffering. He wants us to be in relationship with him, but eventually there will come a point where he is no longer long suffering. And so that's what we're looking at here in tribulation. All right, so if you would turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter two. 
And hang on for the ride, all right? Second Thessalonians chapter two. We're gonna look at verse uh, six and seven. It says, and you know what is restraining him now so that he may be revealed in his time for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way, all right? This is is a prophecy about the Antichrist. The Holy Spirit is restraining all of these events from happening. And when the Holy Spirit says, hey, I'm not restraining this, it is when the beast, the Antichrist says, ah, here we go, now's my time. So at the tribulation, it tells us that the Holy Spirit was, I'm not gonna restrain these things. And so here we get the Antichrist coming to power. In fact, he's gonna sign a covenant with Israel. It's gonna be this, this signifier of going, ah, this is it. You'll find that we're not gonna go there, but in Daniel chapter nine, verses 25 through 27. And this is the beginning of the tribulation. So staying there in 2 Thessalonians chapter two, Go up the page a little bit to verse three. It says, let no one deceive you in any way for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, Antichrist, the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God, the Antichrist. Now let's think about that. We've talked about the rapture. Pastor Paul would, had mentioned or had taught us about that. And then we talked about the bride being, you know, the people that are taken out. Let's put ourselves in that moment. At that moment of the rapture, millions, I don't know, maybe billions of people suddenly disappear. Now think about that. I'm sure I know a, a Christian uh, commercial airline pilot. I'm sure you know some right? Think about it. In that moment, there will be Christian pilots that are no longer there. Those planes go down possibly, All right? There will be people driving on the road, truck drivers going down the road that are Christian. Suddenly they're not there. There will be wrecks, right? There will be leaders that are known throughout the world that are Christ followers that are suddenly gone. Neighbors, spouses, daughters, sons, somebody that's live streaming on Twitch at the time. They're all suddenly going to disappear. And in that moment, there's going to be death, disasters, I mean, talk about your supply chain issues at that moment. Uh, it's going to be real, right? So things are not good in this moment. And so the world's going to be looking for a leader, all right? And instead of turning to the creator, the world's going to be ripe and ready for the Antichrist. Now, real quick, I'm going to call a timeout. I'm an old basketball coach, so we're going to call a quick timeout here. And, and let's, a question that frequently gets asked, let's address it. Will there be Christians in the tribulation? All right, I've, I've heard uh, through my time of growing up, you know, it goes both ways, uh, but I don't believe so. So I want you to know a couple of things about Christianity during the time of the tribulation. First, there are going to be two prophets, right? There are those that believe it's going to be Moses and Elijah. Some say it might be Enoch and Elijah. I don't know. It does not tell us who it is, but it does tell us in Revelation chapter 11, verses one through 13, that there are going to be these two prophets and they are going to be spreading the gospel. They are going to be, hey, this is who God is and what he expects of us. And so they're gonna go around and they're gonna be preaching for three and a half years and they're gonna be killed by the Antichrist. Now, it's really easy, you know, in our day and age now, we can see things happening around the world in a moment's notice right now as we sit here in this room. And so these two men, whoever they may be, are going to be killed. Their bodies are going to be left in the streets for three days, just left there to rot. Uh, and in fact, they're going to actually throw a party over it. And the, the Antichrist is going to say, hey, you know, there it is, took care of that. Uh, and so... He's gonna think he's won at this moment, but here's what happened. After three days, God raises them back to life. He calls them up to heaven. There will be a great earthquake. 7,000 people will die. And to quote scripture, the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. You will find that all in Revelation 11. All right, so we know that there will be these two prophets testifying of the gospel. Not only that, we know that there are going to be 144,000 Jews, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes, 
that are going to accept Jesus as their savior and they are going to be commissioned to go out as, I guess the best way to put it is evangelist. In fact, they will have, and I don't know what this looks like, but we are told that they will be sealed on their foreheads. There will be something that lets people know these are God's chosen people. And because of that, they're going to be protected. You'll find this in Revelation chapter seven, verses one through eight. So back to our question. Will there be Christians in the tribulation? Now, everybody that was a Christian, a Christ follower up to that point to the, to the rapture, they're gone. These are people that accept Jesus as their savior after the rapture. So if you will look at Revelation chapter seven in verse 14 and 15, it says, then one of the elders addressed me, that's John the Revelator saying, who are these clothed in white robes? And from where have they come? I, John, said to him, sir, you know. And he said to me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have, their, they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. So the question is, are there Christians in the tribulation? The answer is yes. Now, does that mean if Jesus is not your savior that you can put things off? Please don't. We're told that our life is but a vapor. That means it's, it's a mist and a, and a mist just disappears. We're here today. We may be gone tomorrow. Please don't put that decision off. Other than that, think about this, the tribulation. I will not do justice today to how bad it will be. If for any reason you accept Jesus as your savior because you don't wanna be here in that moment. Because what we cover Do me a favor. Don't put off for tomorrow what the Father is calling you to do today. All right, time in. All right, let's keep going. All right, first three and a half years, God's wrath against sin, evil, and wickedness. So if you look in your bulletin, uh, I lined some things out for you because like I said, hang on, whoosh, we're not gonna be able to cover everything that in depth, but I put some scriptures, just a handful. There are other scriptures for these points that are on there for you to go through as your week progresses. Stop, look at them up. Don't trust me. Check the scripture, keep me accountable. All right, so let's look at the seven seals. There are seven trumpets and seven bowls. These are all judgments during the tribulation as God is placing on sin, evil, and wickedness. Now, they begin there in Revelation chapter nine, uh, excuse me. Um, oh, I forgot, you know what? It's in the bulletin. <laughs> there you have it. All right, uh, I want us to start though with uh, Revelation uh, chapter six. There we go. I knew I had it. So in Revelation chapter six, we have the beginning of the first judgments. They're called the seal judgments. And the first four are known as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Now, I'm sure many of you have heard that term before, and I want you to know that is not popular culture influencing the Bible. That is the Bible influencing popular culture. So whether you're a college football fan, historian, and you know that the backfield of the 1924 national champion Notre Dame team that were called the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, the sports writer that named them it was after this passage, or whether there are songs that have it, there are music groups, there are movies about it, uh, that is throughout our popular culture, and it comes from this here in scripture. And so we see that the first horse is a white horse and on it rode destruction. This is the Antichrist. Now know this from the name alone, Antichrist. This is the not Christ. This is the opposite of, this is the imitator, not the real thing. And so real quick, I, I want, I just, I love the continuity of scripture of how God shows us all of this. Real quick, flip over to Revelation chapter 19 and verse 11. Revelation 19 and verse 11. All right, it says, Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True. See, this is Jesus when he comes back. The Antichrist is doing everything he can to deceive people. He comes on a white horse, but his is destruction. And it's that point where he starts to consolidate his power and his influence on the entire globe and on all governments and peoples at this time. We see that the next horse is a red horse and that is war. And though the Antichrist starts things off by signing a peace treaty with Israel, now that's sort of a big deal, think about that. 
in, in our lifetime, people in this room, and I remember back, back uh, you know, uh, Nobel Peace Prizes have been given out for people that brought peace to the Middle East. We know that didn't last. And so what's happening here is he signs this peace treaty with Israel and the temple gets rebuilt, the Jewish temple. Now, most people believe that the location of the Jewish temple in antiquity, where it's located in Jerusalem now, there is a Islamic mosque, Dome of the Rock, on that site. Now think about it, for the temple to be rebuilt, the Antichrist makes a, a, or has a treaty that is signed, peace in the Middle East, so much so that the Islamic faith allows the temple to be rebuilt where their mosque is, this is sort of a big deal, all right? So just sort of understand what's going on here. So though he brings peace to the, the Middle East, the red horse is the second horse and it is of war. There is no peace lasting throughout the entire world at this time. There are still wars that are going on as people are trying to consolidate their power post rapture and all the chaos that is going on here. The next horse, the third seal is the black horse. This is famine. Now, this isn't famine like you guys are waiting for us to be done so you can go out to eat, okay? Not that type of famine. This is famine as in a very real, there is no food. People are starving to death. Now, if that's not bad enough, you think about what happens when the food industry is disrupted. We've, we've seen that not that long ago. That affects the economy as well. Why do I tell you these things? I want you to see what's going on during the tribulation. All right, the fourth horse is the pale horse. There are, if you dive into that word of pale horse, there are certain uh, translations. It's a sickly green horse, all right? And this is death. In fact, we know when this seal is open and this horse and its rider comes out, that one quarter of the population dies at that time by either violence, um, by famine, by plague, or this is interesting, hey, check me out, by wild beast. Interesting. So the Antichrist is going to be seen as the answer to man's problems, but he will blaspheme God and he will point all the things that are going on, the adoration, glory, and worship, and the credit to himself, right? He is going to point out that there is in his world construct, no higher power than he is. There is no other earthly power above him. So we see what he is doing at this moment as the seals of judgment are open. Now we have another quick time out because as many in this room will know, as we talk about the antichrist, the beast, a question, another question that comes up often is the mark of the beast. Right? So those that follow the Antichrist will take a mark. We are told in scripture, it is either on the forehead or on their right hand. Now, growing up uh, within churches that were, were into uh, the end times and studying that, it's interesting, uh, we are told in, uh, hold on, what verses? Oh, Revelation chapter 13, if you wanna see it. We're told in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 18 uh, that his number, the Antichrist, is 666. So when I was, so back in the 1970s, it was as they were, you know, sort of, what does this look like? It was commonly presented to me that it would be a tattoo of the literal number 666 on your forehead or on your hand that would show that you are a worshiper of and a follower of the Antichrist. And that mark also allowed you to buy and sell goods. In other words, to do business, to, to go about your daily life. So that was what it was in the 70s. As we got into the late 70s and early 80s, we had something that popped up in, in our world. And I know some of you are like, well, they've always been there. And some of us go, oh, I remember that. And that was the UPC code, the universal product code. So there were those that thought that it was the UPC. You would get a UPC code on your forehead or your hand, and that would be the mark of the beast. I don't know. But let's move along. Does anybody have a, a ID card that they put in front of a sensor that allows them to get into a door at their work or something along those lines, right? Microchip technology. I was reading an article a few years ago that one company, instead of having a card, because you know, you've got it in your little lanyard you know, thing there and it's always in the way or you're losing it or misplacing it or, or you walk away from your desk and you left it on your desk and now you can't get back in. So this company, took the microchip and implanted it in the webbing between the thumb and the index finger so that their employee just has to 
put that right there and the door opens. Now, why do I share this with you? Depending on the technology that's been available to us, what our idea of the mark of the beast has changed according to the idea or the, the technology that's present. I don't know what the mark of the beast will be. It could be something we haven't dreamed of if the Lord tarries. It could be some other type of technology. We don't know. Don't get too hung up on those things, all right? Because throughout the decades, the ideas of that have changed. And I have an idea if the Lord tarries, it will continue to change. But it was something worth addressing because people ask it quite frequently. So let's go back. Time in, all right? Tribulation. Up to this point, wars, famines, plagues, natural disasters. This is God's wrath against sin, evil, and wickedness. We've had the four horsemen of the apocalypse. We're looking at the seven seals, judgments. So we've got uh, seals five, six, and seven. You'll find those in Revelation 6, 9 through 17, and Revelation 8, 1. But real quick, the fifth seal is Christians are martyred for their, for their faith. In other words, those that have, have come to accept Jesus as their savior during this time, they will not take the mark of the beast. So they will be identifiable as not being a follower of the Antichrist. So therefore must be a Christ follower and they will be killed for following Jesus. That's seal five. Seal number six, devastating earthquake. We are told in Revelation chapter 6, 12 through 14, that the sun turns black, that the moon turns red, and that the survivors that don't die in this judgment will be running in Revelation 6, 16 and 17. They'll run into the caves, into the hills, and they will cry out for the mountain to fall in on them and to kill them. In fact, they will say in verse 17, um, 16, it says, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of their wrath has come and who can stand? Notice real quick, they acknowledge who that was, the wrath of the lamb. They acknowledge that. That's interesting. All right, seal number seven, Revelation 8, 1. When the lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half hour. So devastating, so mind-blowing, so hard to fathom that as this seal is opened, the bodies of heaven look and are in silence. Seal number seven is the transition into the next seven judgments. Those are the trumpet seals. So what you'll see as we go through these judgments, they get continually worse. And this was viewed as so bad that they were speechless. So you'll see the seven trumpet judgments in Revelation chapter 8, verse 6 is where it starts. And then it goes through chapter 9 and verse 19. This is on the bulletin. And then it continues and picks up in chapter 11, verses 15 through 19. Trumpet number one. One third of the world's trees are burned up and all grass is consumed. And it reminds you of the seventh plague in Egypt. Trumpet number two, one third of the sea turns to blood. It tells us that one third of the ships sink and one third of ocean life dies. Sounds like the first of the Egyptian plagues. Trumpet number three, one third of fresh water is poisoned. And without that fresh water, more people die. The fourth trumpet, one third of the heavenly bodies that provide light are darkened. You'll see that in Revelation 8, 12. Uh, I happened to be reading an article yesterday and it was talking about these sunspots on the sun and that in just the right uh, instances when they're really, really powerful and they escape the gravitational pull of the, of the sun, that they shoot towards earth and that we've had some really powerful ones, but they just missed us. There is, you can look this up. It's, it's historical. There was one in 1924 and the, the events, the things that happened when this giant sunspot and its, its power hit the earth. Uh, there was one account of a telegraph lineman uh, and that when these magnetic waves uh, hit the area where sparks while he was sending a telegraph started coming out of his forehead. I, it's there, I promise, I'm not making this stuff up. So why do I bring that up? When it talks about 
the one third of the heavenly bodies suddenly are darkened. In fact, it even says at the end that the, one, the sun is dimmer by one third. You know, are these supernovas? There are things within astrophysics that explain all these things. And this is just God using his creation as he created to do what he needs it to do. It's quite fascinating. So think about it. If the sun is dimmed by one third, think about how much cooler it's going to be. I mean, that's, that's significant. Think about what is going on cataclysmically within our creation, within the physical universe. All right, so that's the first four of the trumpets. At that point, the angels gathered together in Revelation 8, verse 13, and they say, whoa, whoa, whoa. They are announcing that, hey, those, those four were bad. These three, they're even worse. So trumpet number five, demonic locusts come out of a pit. They attack non-Christians. It won't kill them. It will only torture them. In fact, in Revelation 9, 6, it says that they will seek death and will not find it. All right? Number six, four angels are released and they will lead a cavalry of troops to kill one third of humanity. Now think about it. One quarter already died earlier in the seals. A third of what's left now is being killed. In fact, look at Revelation 9, verse 20 and 21. Let's look at the response. Now, we saw an earlier response where they realized it was the wrath of the Lamb of God, right? They're having some light bulb moments. Now, let's look at this. In Revelation 9, verse 20, it says, The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent. You see the rebellion of mankind against a gracious, loving, righteous, and just God. It says, it did not repent of the works of their hands, nor give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood. It says, those idols, they cannot see or hear or walk. Nor did they repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. All of this is going on. And their response is to still shake their fist at God. All right, so that was trumpet number six. Trumpet number seven, Revelation chapter 11, if you want to flip some pages over there. So Revelation chapter 11, verse 15 says, Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ. He shall reign forever and ever. This is this glimpse behind the curtain letting us know this is setting up God returning his creation to the way he intended it to be. Jesus, Lord of Lord, kings of, King of kings, reigning over his earth. All right, so let's look at verse 16 and 18, though, 16 through 18. If you'll look down there, it says that in response to this, the nations raged, but your wrath come. That's Jesus. And it was a time for the dead to be judged, for the rewarding of servants, the prophets and saints, and those who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. We see this loving, righteous God rewarding those that sought him and bringing justice to those that did not. So anytime that we look at scripture, you should ask yourself this, what does it tell me? And it doesn't matter where you're looking. What does it tell me about God or about Jesus or about the Holy Spirit? In other words, about the Trinity. What am I learning about him? Because all of this is testament to who he is. So let's talk, ta stop and take another quick time out. What are we learning about God? It says, God wants relationship with us, we talked about. Second Peter 3, 9, he's not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Right? We are learning through the tribulation that God made a way for him to have a relationship with us. In other words, there are those that do get saved during the tribulation and Lord willing, we accept him as savior before that. And we know that from John three sixteen, God loved us so much that he sent his son Jesus to pay a price for sin that we could not pay for. What else do we learn? We learn that God gave signs and wonders to the entirety of the earth. Everything we have looked at in this message up to this point 
in the tribulation is being witnessed by the globe. What else do we learn? We learn that a holy, righteous God judges those who continue to rage against God's simple invitation to come to him. You see, God is not mean and spiteful. God is just, he's true, he's trustworthy. He does what he says. All right, let's continue on. We went from the trumpets. Now we're going into the seven bowl judgments, the last of the seven. If you want to, you can flip over to Revelation chapter 16. And it starts out in verse one. It says, then I heard a loud voice from the temple telling the seven angels, go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. And it starts with the first one. Now, as you look into the, the different translations and to the, the meaning of these words, I sort of put all of the different translations together, how they describe this. The first of these judgments are horrible, foul, festering, loathsome sores on everyone who received the mark of the beast. Now, sometimes in, in teaching classes in the past and, and whether talking about Job or, or talking about leprosy and Jesus healing the lepers, we'll Google images and we'll go to Google images and go, what do boils look like? What does leprosy and all that look like? And, and by the way, don't do it right now because it's just, okay, all right. If you were to do that, just know this. The description of these is unlike any other descriptions. So whatever you come up with Google Images is not going to come close to what these horrible, foul, festering, loathsome sores will be like for everyone that received the mark of the beast. That's the first bowl, bowl judgment. The next one is the rest of the sea is turned to blood. So remember a third earlier, the other two thirds, all turns to blood and everything in the oceans die. The oceans are dead. Sort of ponder that for a second. Bowl number three, it says the rest of all fresh water is turned to blood. In fact, real quick, look at Revelation chapter 16. We're still there going down to verse five. And it says, and I heard the angel in charge of the waters say, just are you, O holy one, who is and who was, for you brought these judgments for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets. These are the people that are being judged. This is what they have done. And you have given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve. They've been given their opportunity. There have been the two prophets. There have been the 144,000. There are Christ followers that are telling people about Jesus and they have said no. And this is the outworking of that. Bowl number four, this judgment says the sun scorches people with fire, with fierce heat. I believe this goes back to supernova, to the sunspots, those type of situations. But what's interesting is once again, the people's response. If you look in verse nine, it says that they cursed the name of God. Bowl judgment number five, the earth is plunged into darkness. Now, is this, it did go supernova and the sun extinguishes, goes into a black, uh, black hole? I, I don't know. I'm not sure. I, I, I really do enjoy astrophysics, but it's way above my head, but I still like reading about it. What this looks like, or is this the power of God just saying, uh, I don't have to use the physics I created. It's just done. Turn it off. You know, turned off the light switch. I don't know what that looks like, but I know that this is true. Number six, the Euphrates River dries up. And then it tells us that the kings of the east, these are rulers of areas that are under the, uh, the Antichrist and their armies, they cross over the river. Now, again, growing up and, and going through conferences and stuff like this, people have spent, I don't know how much time trying to figure out within the geopolitical outlook of the world at that time, who these countries are and who these leaders are. Uh, so much so you go back to when the, the European economic, uh, the EU started, right? There were 10 countries in that. And they're like, oh, here's the 10 countries. I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. But I know that there will be rulers on this earth at this time that will gather and they will gather. And, and if you look down in verse 16 there in a place called Armageddon, and we are told that, they are there to wage war against God. 
So these kings, these rulers, these armies will gather at... Now, where is Armageddon? Most scholars and most historians, there is a valley of Megiddo that is nearby Jerusalem there, and most people believe that that is it. And I don't have any reason to doubt that, but would I, you know, stake you, this is it? I personally would not. I I know there are others that say it is, but uh, we do know that it is given this name and that these kings and rulers and armies gather at this place, and then we get the seventh bowl judgment. In Revelation 16, starts in verse 17, and we hear a loud voice that says, it is done. Then we get to verse 18, and we're told that there's the worst earthquake ever, so much so that in verse 19, it tells us that Jerusalem is split into three parts and that the great cities of the world collapse. So it is an earthquake. Now we've all, again, in this this data age that we live in, we've seen when there are earthquakes and we know the devastation and the destruction of what that looks like. Now let's take it. And again, it's John Stotzenberg's imagination. It goes places. I just see this. Yeah, the Richter scale might be zero to 10. I don't think this is on the Richter scale. I think this goes well off that scale. But again, that's my personal imagination. So we have this earthquake. We see that the world cities collapse. Then in verse 20, we see that the islands are flooded. In other words, the islands are now below sea level and that the mountains disappear. Does this earthquake, again, my imagination, cause the earth to crumble? And so as those rocks and whatever it is slide into the oceans, it raises the water over the islands? I don't know. Or is it God just, and it happens? but I know that it does happen. And then verse 21, giant hailstones. If you do the math on on the the measurement they give you, it's about a hundred pound hailstones. Now we we get, I mean, we see baseball size. We're like, whoa, dude, hundred pound hailstones crushing people. And yet we find that people continue to curse God. And it's... (laughs) sort of a tough message to preach, just to let you know, all right? Yeah, this is not when everybody goes out to supper, you know, lunch together, and you're like, hey, well, was so yeah, it was great. Woo. We need to know these things because these things should move us to understand what God has called us to do. Love God, love others, make disciples, go into Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. But with that said, I'm not going to leave you at this point. Everybody, I know it's, we're, we're in Revelation. We'll go back there in a second. But go to Acts chapter 1, verse 10. Acts chapter 1 and verse 10. And it says, And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. This is the second coming of Jesus. This is the beginning of the end. This is the triumph. This is the white horse. And just as he left, he comes again. We're told in Zechariah 14, 4, we're actually told that he comes back at the Mount of Olives. If you go to Matthew chapter 24 in verses uh, 29 through 30, we're told immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened. We know that already. And the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the son of man. All the tribes of earth will mourn and see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. Titus 2.13 says, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Revelation 19, you can go back there, verse 11, it tells us that, Then I saw heaven open and behold, a white horse. We read this earlier. The one sitting on it is called faithful and true. Faithful, that means he doesn't stop. He is consistently consistent with us in his love, in his grace, in his mercy, in his righteousness, in his judgment, in his holiness. And he is true. He is the way, the truth, and the life. 
That passage continues on and says that not only is he faithful and true, the name by which he is called is the word of God. If you look down in verse 16, you'll see that on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So we see Jesus, the second coming. This is him coming with his army to put an end to the Antichrist, to put an end to his prophet, to put an end to sorrow and mourning and pain, to establish creation as God intended it to be. If you'll look in verses 17 and 18 in between these two passages, it's something we should be quite familiar with. And actually an angel calls the birds to come because after Jesus comes, it is a complete and total victory. All right, there wasn't, you know, somebody that escaped and got away. It is a hundred percent victory. And this angel calls the birds. Well, we know about it, you know, come on. Buzzards, we see them all the time. They're God's little vacuum cleaners on the side of the road, right? He actually uses these vultures and he calls them and they start to clean the death and the destruction at the Battle of Armageddon. Now let's, let's finish again. Not gonna leave you on that one. Revelation 19, look at verse 19. So chapter 19, verse 19. It says, then I saw the beast and the kings of the world and their armies gathered together to fight against the one sitting on the horse and his army. And the beast was captured. And with him, the false prophet who did mighty miracles on behalf of the beast. In other words, we have the Antichrist and his hype man. Miracles that deceived all who had accepted the mark of the beast and who worshiped his statue. That's what the hype man did. Both the beast and his false prophet were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. Their entire army was killed by the sharp sword that came from the mouth of the one riding on the white horse. And the vultures all gorged themselves on the dead bodies. Like we mentioned last week, you know, here's the thing. We're reading the end of the story. It's like us binging something on Netflix and going to the last episode to see how everything turns out so we're not as nervous at the beginning, right? We know the end here. You see, I know, I am certain of what my future is. Jesus is my Lord and Savior. But here's my question. If you're not certain of what the future holds for you, if you don't understand that peace that passes all understanding that is ours when we are in Christ Jesus and Christ in us, if you're dealing with that, I just want you to know that Jesus wants relationship with you. He doesn't want you to go through this. So when we're done today, there'll be a deacon or two up here, I'll be up here. And if you wanna know that certainty, if you wanna know that peace, that passes all understanding by relationship with him, will you come and will you talk with us? But just know this, the tribulation, it's awful. But Jesus is Lord of Lord and King of Kings and we know how the end ends up. So at this time, we're gonna close in prayer. But after we close, I'm going to invite Pastor Robbie up here for a special announcement. So let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we love you and praise you. Lord, we're in awe of your power, your might, your holiness, your justice, your righteousness. And in the midst of our sinfulness, you still love me, O oh Lord. So may we take that certainty, may we take that faith and may we live it out. Lord, may we love others, love you. May we make disciples. May we be worshipers of you as we go throughout our week. May we stop and understand and be grateful that we know the end of the book. Lord, we praise you. We worship you in the name of Jesus. Everyone said, amen. amen. Pastor Robbie. Good morning, y'all. John, that was so good. Thank you so much. Uh, it's such a blessing, uh, ministry, uh, just to be able to serve, to be able to be a part of what we do as a body of believers. And there's a lot of joys in ministry. Ministry. One of the greatest joys that we get to have is when we see somebody come to Jesus and also when we see somebody called by Jesus to be a servant of him and his kingdom. So I'm going to ask Caleb Brand to come up real fast.
And Caleb, I've known for many years, uh, even though I haven't worked at Bolverde Baptist for very long, and I've lived in many different states. My wife used to babysit him, um, and I got to see him when he was probably about this, this tall. So now he's grown up a little bit, but Caleb has demonstrated a calling in his heart uh, to serve God to the fullest extent, and that is to serve him in full-time ministry. And he has a wonderful opportunity this summer to go to his grandfather's church, Royal Haven Baptist, and to go and summer intern this summer. Uh, so as a church body, I wanted to bring this to your attention, not to draw attention to him or to what we're doing as a student ministry or as a church, but to give God glory in seeing that he calls and he calls and he equips and he equips very well. And I want to challenge us as a church to pray over Caleb and also our students, because each and every one of us are called to serve and serve well, whether it's in full-time ministry or just full-time Christians loving on people in the name of Jesus. But I want to bring it to your attention that Caleb needs some prayer this summer. Uh, I remember being in his shoes. I remember being young. I remember trying to figure out all of things, and I'm still trying to figure out a lot of stuff still. But the blessing of it is that we have Jesus Christ guiding us and keeping us in step with him each and every way. And Caleb, this is a challenge to you too, man, because it's hard. You and I have had conversations. We know, you know, where we struggle and how we wrestle with certain things. And it's about keeping in step with the Spirit each and every way. And I'm going to read you some of my favorite scriptures when it comes to this calling, man. This is Matthew chapter 28, specifically in verse 18. It says, And Jesus came and said to them, them being the disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So we got something special for you. This is actually your dad's idea. And in the very front, he could probably talk to you more about it. But he's got some special writing in there that matches up with what, you know, I know I'm going to make him cry. This is great. I love this. Um, but man, you know, we love you as a church. And students, I, wanna, I want you to understand something. We love you guys. Like, Caleb is special, but <laughs> it's not just because his dad works here or because, you know, I've known him very long. It's because you guys are special. Each and every one of you in church, you are special people because you've been called and you've been commissioned by the blood of Jesus Christ to go. That's why this is special. So let's go ahead and bow our heads. I'm going to pray over Caleb. And as a church, I would love it if you all prayed alongside with me just in your own space to the Lord and glorify him for this wonderful opportunity. Lord God, we love you for how you commission us to go, to tell others about the good news of your son, and Lord, I pray for Caleb, and I pray over Caleb, as many of us do, for wisdom, for strength, for humility, for patience, for self-control, for trusting in you in all things. Let him not lean on his own understanding, and let not his desires get in the way, but let his desires reflect you in all things. Let him always come before you when it comes to anything, Lord God, and guide his footsteps. Allow his words to be seasoned with salt, Lord God, and allow him to give glory each and every step of the way to you and you alone, Lord Jesus. We thank you so much for this wonderful and blessed opportunity to be able to rally around as the church, Caleb, as he goes and he seeks after this wonderful opportunity as being an intern and learning more about what it means to be the literal hands and feet of you, being a servant of our King of our Lord and our Master. And I pray, Lord God, and I lift him up to you, Lord, that you guide him each and every step of the way. Allow wise men and women to gather around him and speak truth to him so that he can speak your truth to others and tell the beautiful, beautiful message of the gospel of Jesus Christ to those that are hurting, who are broken, and need to be sharpened, Lord Jesus. We love you and we give you thanks in all things. In your son's holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Hey, church, thank you again so much for being here. Yeah, man, I love it. Okay, all right, yeah. Everyone knows I'm not a hugger, but 
for that kid. I'll take it. Church, thank you so much for being here. We love you so much. There's many ways that you can get plugged in. You know, we want to love on you. We want to disciple. We want to encourage. We want to sharpen you so, so much. But right now, you are dismissed. If you have any questions, or I guess we're, you're sent. That's what Paul says now. Yeah, we're sent, man. You know, but if you have any questions or you would like to talk to one of us up here, the deacons will be up front. And you can please, if you're new, check out the deacons table. Get a bag right there from them. Sign some information. But we love you. Have a wonderful week. And we look forward to seeing you next Sunday.